spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Well, Aloha and good morning. Happy Aloha Friday. Thanks so much for tuning in here. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, we continue on in our conversations with candidates for the race for Honolulu City Council. That's right. There are four seats, and we have covered all of them. This is the last one in that series. If you missed any of those, of course, you can go back to the Star Advertiser's website, and that has the full archive of our past shows. Uh, this is to represent District 8, Central Oahu. This is to succeed Brandon Elefante, who is termed out. This area includes a YPO Gentry, Waimalu, Pearl City, and Mililani, basically the really heart of central Oahu. Uh, the people who are vying to represent that are uh, Brand, uh, excuse me, Val Okimoto and Ron Minor. Uh, political, uh, not political newcomers, but folks that people are familiar with. Thank you both for being here. Glad to Thank join you. Having well, let's start with the basics. And Ron, we'll start with you. Why do you want to run, uh, for, why do you want to hold this seat? And what specifically do you see as the biggest issue facing this district? Well, I'm running for city council because I'd like to continue my work as a council member on the critical issues facing our island. Our island faces significant challenges requiring effective and experienced leadership, which I have established through my record as a former city council member. So I'm, I would be able to hit the ground running and uh, not have to learn about city government while on the job. Quality of life issues are critically important to the residents of District 8. These include fixing, deteriorating, uh, infrastructure, including city roadways and other infrastructure, implementing measures to promote traffic and pedestrian safety, creating more affordable housing opportunities for our local residents, more effectively addressing our homeless crisis, increasing support for police and first responders, including filling the 300 vacant unfilled positions within the Honolulu Police Department, and ensuring that our communities receive their fair share of improvements and resources that city government is obligated to provide to our communities. In addition to those issues, cost of living issues are also important. You know, I'm really uh, knowledgeable about these issues because of the fact that I've devoted countless hours volunteering for civic organizations and uh, supporting numerous uh, community organizations. So as such, uh, I believe I'm very attuned to the issues and concerns of the district and I would like to address them as a city council member. Yeah, and Val, same question for you. Why are you seeking this office, particularly since you uh, were a state lawmaker? Why move to the city side? And what do you see as the biggest issue facing this district? Thank you, Yanji. And thank you, Ryan, once again, for having us on um, this Spotlight Forum. You know, I, I decided to run for this specific position, the same reason I decided to run for the state house four years ago, and that was to bridge the gap between the elected officials and what I consider myself the everyday person. You know, I've really worked really hard to be engrossed in the community to serve. And in doing so, I've learned that our community, they're really having a hard time trusting our elected officials. And I wanna bridge that gap. I wanna be that voice. And I've worked, you know, tirelessly with our community and I will continue to do so. Um, I think our state and our island today is looking for new leadership, leadership that has the energy and the vision to move us in a, in a positive forward direction. And that's one of the main reasons. Um, a little bit of background about myself. I, I do come from the neighbor island, Kauai, born and raised there. So I'm very grounded and rooted in these islands. I was taught to be humble, but hardworking. And as a single mom and as a former special education teacher and also a state legislator, I feel like I bring a wide variety of angles and experience to be able to help me continue to learn and grow, but also have that vision and that willpower to make a positive change for our, our island here in the county of Honolulu. Well, one of the issues that uh, you know, you'll know you have to tackle, either one of you, get if you get into office, and that directly impacts your community is rail. It's something that has been a part of the conversation at the city council for quite some time now. 
Uh, wanted to get your thoughts about where the project stands right now. Uh, Val, in the State House, you've had to work a little bit on the rail, rail with uh, different proposals, but not as intimately as those who have worked on the council thus far. We'll start off with you with your thoughts about the current projections uh, and, and your concerns and your thoughts about how to continue to move this project forward. Thank you. Great question. And even when I was running for the State House, you know, my first time in 2018, the rail has always been a hot topic because even if it doesn't, it doesn't directly um, pass through our district, well, the district that I currently serve, it will pass, pass through District 8 um, in Pearl City. We're all being taxed. We're all having to bear, um, bear the responsibility of funding this project. So I was taught and raised when you start a project, you finish it. And I see that the same with the rail. When we started this project, we promised our residents that they would be able to receive it and I will do my best and I would love to see it being finished you know within my tenure in the hopeful city council um that being said I do know that our our people are very overburdened with taxes at this time cost of living which is the main concern with the district that that um both you know that we're fighting to represent and that I currently live in that's something that we can't we have to be cognizant of we can't overburden our taxpayers more than they already are so the goal for me, I would love to see it being finished all the way to UH. You know, at this point, I think it's manageable. Hopefully we can get it to, to Ala Moana because that will service um, the communities between the West Side Kapolei and all the way to downtown, especially to help out with the commuters that are struggling right now to be able to get in and out and hopefully alleviate the traffic. But that, you know, I, I've spoken up repeatedly about not overburdening our taxpayers in the process of doing so. And Ron, for you, uh, you know, obviously you are, were part of the city council, have had to see the rail through many uh, tumultuous times, different leadership. Uh, if given the opportunity to head back, how do you see yourself helping to finish this project and your concerns and thoughts moving forward with rail? Well, let me first of all say that I'm gratified that the Federal Transit Administration or FDA has finally approved uh, Hart's uh, recovery plan which will enable the city to receive the remaining $744 million in badly needed uh, construction fund funding for the rail project. This is a positive outcome that I had strongly advocated for in my meetings with federal transit administration administrators, administrators since, since the time that I served the city council chair. Uh, I also support the aspect of the recovery plan that would shorten the rail route to the Kaka'ako Civic Center station location based on the revenue projections of HART that uh, actual and projected federal, state and city revenues will not be, will only be, su be sufficient to uh, complete rail uh, to Kaka'ako as an interim uh, terminus. But you know, as the project move, moves forward, I would also like the HART to consider cost saving measures. For example, I'd like them to consider alternate design and engineering solutions, including reducing or eliminating unnecessary features at the rail stations that add considerable cost to the project. And as a council member who represented Central Oahu, I must tell you that I was concerned when Hart deleted the Pearl Highlands parking garage from its recovery plan. Uh, during the time that I served on the council, I was a strong advocate for the integration of the parking garage as part of the rail project in order to uh, make it more convenient for central Oahu residents to access rail. And this is very important because one of the justifications for rail uh, is to provide an alternative mode of transportation for central Oahu residents who have to endure the worst traffic congestion on this island. So one of my top priorities in regards to rail will be to meet with heart and city officials to try to come up with a plan for an alter alternative uh, parking facility uh, more specifically, I'd like Hart to seriously consider consider entering into a public-private partnership to build and operate a parking facility in that particular area. So these are my concerns about the real project. You know, the city council has to... Oh, I, I was hoping to quickly add just something really quick. I'm sorry, Angie, to cut you off. But with that project that, that Ron did mention, it is a very big frustration for us as residents because that was promised. To me, that's, that's a sign of the bigger pro problem, that many projects are started and, and either not thought through properly or they were their the information was known and it was it was begun when it shouldn't have and the taxpayers are carrying that burden so i am all 
in support of making sure that we have the proper audit and holding people accountable that got us to this position. The parking structure that he's talking about should have never been built because they knew beforehand that the ground underneath it was not stable enough and they did it anyway. Now we're paying for it and that's not, that's not acceptable. I want to ask you about the relationship between the council and the mayor. We know that the council and the mayor, you know, for the city to go well, need to work hand in glove. Ron, I'm interested, we'll start with you, what your uh, thoughts are on the current leadership and how you would work with the Blangiardi administration. Well, one of my first actions as a council member will be to sit down with Mayor Blangiardi and, and his key administrators, uh, some of whom I've, I've known because I, I worked with them during the time that I served at the council. But I'd like to meet with them to introduce myself and to get a better sense of their priorities and to let them know about my priorities as well, especially those that will impact my district. I've always tried to maintain a collaborative working relationship with the city administration because I really believe that at the end of the day, in spite of whatever differences the council may have with the mayor, that ultimately we have to work towards the common good, towards the public interest. So I've always believed in collaboration. On the other hand, if as a, as a council we uh, disagree with the mayor's position, and we believe that an alternative position should be advanced. And of course, the council should uh, should take that position and explain our position to the mayor. And in the process, try to perhaps reach a middle ground so that we can accomplish uh, positive things for the uh, taxpayers of this of this city. So uh, I do want to meet with the mayor and his administration uh, if I'm elected to the council and and, uh, and see how we can move things forward in a positive direction. Val, what's your take on the current administration? You know, how, how would you work with them? I would continue to work with the mayor as I do with the current administration and the state legislature, as I do with everybody else. Um, always being respectful, positive. And, you know, I've been really grateful to have opportunities, both in the House and the Senate, to work with their leadership, even across the aisle. And that's the kind of person I am. I don't let titles or um, social boundaries really um, stop me from being able to to meet and collaborate. And that's something that you know I'm grateful for that working with, whether working in the House or the Senate, I've been able to, to interact with my colleagues as leadership. And I see myself doing the same thing with this current council, as well as with the mayor who I've, I've all already spoken with. And I look forward to continuing to collaborate. You know, he and I align with many um, on many issues that's similar. So I'm gonna continue doing what I've always done and just be positive and collaborate in an effective manner. Let's shift gears here and talk a little more about affordable housing, uh, especially in the district that you represent. Uh, it is made up largely of a lot of local families, uh, many generational families within the districts that you would represent. Uh, and yet we find ourselves uh, once again with struggling with finding uh, affordable housing for the next generation or just for families in general who are struggling to uh, afford a home, especially with interest rates the way, way that they are. Val, we'll start off with you. What do you think specifically within your district can you do to help those who may be struggling to find uh, and want to own prop property, but struggling with just the price and cost of living overall? And that's the key, Ryan, really. It's the overall cost of living. It, it, affordable housing is very important. We need that here. But we know land is a high commodity here. It's limited because we live in an island state. So I have, you know, multifaceted approach to this. In Mililani specifically, we don't grow, we don't develop anymore. Other than um, just recently last week, you know, I was able to attend a groundbreaking for an, an older affordable um, housing project for older um, residents, and that's partnering with Catholic charities. But in general, we not we're not developing anymore. But in Pearl City, that area is prime for um, development along the rail line, which I'm excited about, not just for housing but also for industries and, and job opportunities. Economic development is one of my main focuses, probably at the top of my focus, because if we're not addressing the cost of living and allowing our residents to be able to have quality jobs, training, education, something that will be able to provide for their families, then no matter how much housing we, we, we create, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna solve the problem. So to me, it's, it's finding that balance of proper economic development, responsible development, but having um, the housing issue be addressed. And we all know the elephant in the room is the Department of Planning and Permitting. That's something that has to be taken a look at, have a, an overhaul where necessary, removing the bureaucracy, removing the unnecessary steps and making sure that they hire properly People can't be waiting two to three months to have a job so that we can have these permits processed faster. And therefore, housing can be you know, done exponent, uh, ex expeditiously and efficiently and not having to cost the taxpayers or the people who are trying to get homes more than they should. Uh, Ron, same question for you regarding affordable housing, specifically uh, in your district and, and how you would help to solve some of those issues. Well, let me first of all say that as a council member, 
I, I tried as one council member to try to facilitate the creation of more affordable housing opportunities for our local residents. For example, I introduced and uh, authored uh, Resolution 14-200, which led to the establishment of our city's accessory dwelling unit or ADU program. Moreover, as a zoning planning and housing committee chair, I obtained council approval for numerous affordable housing projects throughout the island. And I was also the co-author of Ordinance 19-18, our short-term rental law. And the one key reason why I pushed the, for this law is the fact that I recognize that the proliferation of illegal vacation rentals reduces the inventory of badly needed housing for our local residents. But clearly more needs to be done. As a, and as a policymaker, I recognize that there is no panacea, that it's going to take a multifaceted approach to continue to more effectively address the issue. And I think that this approach should include approving more housing projects through the 201H process, which is an expedited review and approval process under state law, utilizing more city land, providing financial and other incentives under our land use ordinance for affordable housing development, developing and implementing rent to own housing options on the city level, tapping into our affordable housing fund to purchase and refurbish uh, vacant or distressed uh, properties, uh, rehabilitating our city's large inventory of affordable rentals, uh, expanding our ADU program, which as I indicated, I co-authored, and as well as more effectively enforcing our short-term rental law. And I'd also like to emphasize that an overriding issue is the city must do more to address or improve our permitting system. And as a council member, I consistently urged the city administration to improve the system, and I will continue to do so as a council member. We've reached about the halfway mark, and this is the opportunity we now present to both of you to ask questions of each other. Ron, we'll start with you. What's your question for Val? Yeah. Okay, during this campaign, you have stated that you would be responsive to the views of the residents of our district if you were elected to the city council. And yet, as a Republican state representative, you introduced the bill, HB 1954, that would have eliminated mail-in voting, which has made it more convenient for people to vote and which is supported by the vast majority of our fellow residents. And so although you have promised to listen to the wishes of your constituents as a council member, doesn't the action that you took as a Republican legislator to eliminate our right to mail-in voting say otherwise? Well, great question. That bill actually came up, I believe, in my first session in 2019. And at that time, the county of Kauai, where I'm originally from, was going to be the, it was the trial position, a trial um, county where they were going to try it out and see. And they actually, I think um, Scott Nago came to the Capitol and told us that they actually weren't yet quite equipped. So when the, the blanket came out to do it statewide, I was a little concerned. I'm not against mail-in voting. I've, I've always been about, I actually always vote absentee ballot because to me that's effective for my choice. I, there are many residents who feel that they want the choice to be able to, to go in to the polling place and that's, that's their right to vote. So my, my introduction to that was for one, I didn't believe that at that time we had the infrastructure to manage this. It was a cost that was gonna be incurred upon our taxpayers and to listen to the residents um, because they felt the need that if they wanted to, they had the choice to, you can, still, you, can, you can apply for an absentee ballot and you can vote mail-in. But if you choose to not to, they wanted that right to be able to go in person. And you know, Ron, great question you know, about responding. I still, till today, I pride myself and not just myself, but my office in responding to constituent concerns. During COVID, we took endless amounts of calls, not just from my district, not even just from Milanani, but from neighbor islands, because they knew and they were told, if you're not getting a response from your representative, we'll call back with OK Motors office and we would take them. I don't know where they heard these things, but they knew that we would respond. And so I, while this bill may, at the forefront, you're, it may seem like I wasn't in response to our voters, that's not actually not true. And I take pride in the office and the, the staff that I have because we really put our constituents first. Sometimes, and many times, not even within our jurisdiction, not even state issues, county issues, as a state representative, we would take it and we would help them because I would never sit there and just let a constituent not have their, their needs to be met. Ron, do you have a response? Yes, for clarification, uh, that bill was introduced during the 2020 election year. Very important year, a presidential election year. And had... Uh, Val's bill been passed by the legislature, the residents of Hawaii would have been prevented from voting in the presidential election through the mail-in voting process. And of course, uh, the 20, 2020 elections, uh, presidential election, was uh, 
involved the, the re-election effort of uh, President Donald Trump. And of course, as we know, the, the, the Trump supporters strongly oppose mail-in voting. So I believe that the uh, bill that Val introduced was in fact in support and furtherance of the Trump agenda, which has always been opposed to mail-in voting, which really is important because it makes voting more, more convenient. And in fact, mail-in voting has resulted in an increase in the number of people who come out to vote, which is what we want in terms of promoting a healthy democracy. Okay, Val, okay, and now okay, it's your, your okay, opportunity okay. to oh, ask okay. him a question uh, okay. but, because we're going to run out of time. So you can okay, ask him a question, you. he'll okay. respond, and then you can have a rebuttal okay. to his response. Okay. Go ahead. So this is less a question from, from me, but more of a question from our constituents within the district. Um, and this is their concern. Ron, you have been in government for nearly four decades. You've held numerous positions in the city council and your time as a member, as a member of the House of Representatives and the Hawaii State Senate, in which you held influential, powerful positions, which you've mentioned. Today, the cost of living is higher across the board. Today, the median price of a home is over a million dollars. Our constituents are not asking for a continuation of the norm. They want positive change. They want accountability and they want to be able to raise their families in Hawaii. So my question from my community, our community to you is, do you consider yourself a career politician? And if not, what would you do differently besides continuing what you've done over the last nearly four decades that has not resulted in more affordable housing or a reduced cost of living? No, I'm running for public office because of my deep and lifelong commitment to public service. In fact, uh, I remain committed to public service as a way to give back to the communities in which I've been fortunate to live, work, and raise my families. As, a, as an elected official, I've never a claim that I would be able to solve all the problems in our state or our country uh, by myself. Uh, that, that's just not going to be possible. But uh, what I have been able to do is during the time that I've served as an elected official, and in particular on the city council, I believe that uh, I, I have a record of accomplishment where we have made improvements in the quality of life uh, of the residents uh, of our island and in particular uh, in my district. For example, I've already mentioned the affordable housing issue. Clearly more needs to be done. But I work closely with affordable housing developers to increase the inventory of affordable rentals on this island. Uh, a clear example of projects that uh, my committee approved include the uh, Hale Valico uh, Hale uh, project for seniors at the old IAS sugar mill site, the uh, Westlock uh, affordable housing project, the Como Hale project, as well as the affordable apartment housing complex that is going to be built on city-owned land in Kapolei Parkway. And I already, I've already mentioned my work on in establishing the ADU program, as well as reining in the proliferation of illegal vacation rentals. In regards to homelessness, you know, I frequently worked with city officials, uh, social service outreach workers, HPD and community stakeholders to clear homeless encampments within my district and to connect homeless individuals to social service providers and facilities where they could receive the assistance they needed. And most importantly, you know, the primary responsibility of city government is, is to ensure that our communities receive the full range of services that they're entitled to. And I'd like to say that during the time that I served on the council, that my district always received its fair share of resources for the kinds of improvements that we need in terms of uh, road, park, and sideway improvements, adequate police and fire protection, trash collection, bus service, and programs to benefit our youth, senior, and family activities. So uh, I believe that during the time that I served on the council, we, we made significant progress in addressing the critical issues uh, facing uh, our district and the entire island. And I'm, I, I wanna continue my work on those issues uh, as a council member going forward. And Val, would you like to respond? Yes, thank you. So. You know, as I'm walking doors in our community, in our current community, not even just Pearl City, the people are tired, they want new. And my question to you, once again, was what are you planning to do differently? The reason that there's term limits in the council is because there's term limits. You have a time to do what you set out to do. And so I asked, you know, I, I would I again challenge Ron, I, I'm hearing the same thing, um, things that have been done in the past, but the people want new, they want motivation and change. So I'm, I think, while well, those things are said, I, I would like to hear what you would do differently, because if you're just going to continue with the things that were done in the past, it has not really gotten us into a more positive state right now. Well, well I, want to, I want to move this forward uh, if we can, because we've had time. But, but one of the things that will be new uh, and a lot of people are talking about, so it kind of ties into a question, is the new Aloha Stadium. I, I want to ask your thoughts on what you believe uh, should be done. Obviously, there is some disagreement now with the governor and the legislature 
Uh, but ultimately, it also will impact those who live in and around your district as well. Uh, your thoughts on what that area should be used for if you had the opportunity to weigh in uh, and what you're, you're hearing from those members who live in the nearby districts uh, of Aloha Stadium. Ron, we'll start off with you. Well, I just want to say again that in terms of my campaign, uh, instead of talking generalities as Val has done about change and what have you, she hasn't offered any specific proposals, but I have. So we need to move forward with specific proposals, not just mere generalities. But as, as far as Aloha Stadium, of course, that is uh, a state issue. However, uh, in regards to the uh, possible future development of the areas adjacent to the stadium, the surrounding areas, that could be a city issue because it would require a possible zoning changes, a possible change to the uh, transit orient TOD plan for the particular area. And so I think that the, the city council working together with the state, of, uh, state uh, government should uh, be very open in terms of looking at all the possibilities uh, in regards to uh, the, the possible uses of the surrounding lands adjacent to the stadium. So this, this could include housing. We need more affordable housing, but how much of it do we need? And to what extent do we allow affordable housing development and allow it in such a way that it doesn't create the negative impacts on the surrounding communities. We also have talked about the retail and possible commercial activities uh, in, in, in the area. So all of these will re ultimately require city approval, uh, city review. And I always believe that whenever a major project comes before the council that uh, is calling for uh, significant development in, com in communities, that it's very important to receive community input. So before any final decisions are made regarding the kinds of developments that we want to see in the surrounding areas adjacent to the stadium, I think we need to receive the input of the uh, IA Neighborhood Board, uh, the other community leaders, community residents. And uh, as a council member, I'd be very open to conducting hearings in that regard when the time comes for us to uh, review those kinds of projects. And Val, your thoughts on this project? Yeah, I was, you know, like many, we were, I was a little surprised that um, Governor Yee came out with the late announcement. I, I've been in support of it. I think while the Aloha Stadium is right outside of our, our district, there's lots of development. And while my opponent has stated many times about speaking in generalities, I, I don't speak in generalities. I think I speak for the everyday person. And I've been specific about what I think is opportunities for us in Pearl City specifically. We have opportunity zones, federal funded um, areas where we can partner with the government and partner with um, the private industry. We have these PPP, these P3s, where we can have new industries along the rail line, which would pass through the stadium. I am all about looking forward. I have two daughters. I want them to be able to, choose, if they choose to live here, stay here, have jobs. And so specifically, I would like to tap into where these opportunity zones are in our specific district. How can we partner with the federal government and the private industries to create jobs here for us? As, as well as housing. How can we do, be responsible in our development? That's what I'm creating for. I'm looking forward to increasing our tax base by not just having affordable housing, but really we don't, we don't want to relegate our district, our, our members to just um, lower cost of living. We want to incentivize them to be able to get jobs and put money into our tax base. And that's how we can then address the, the issues that we need to and fund projects that, are, that will benefit the entire community. The time goes fast and we are just about out of time. I want to give you each an opportunity to share a final thought and perhaps, um, you know, what unique in your life experience do you bring to this to this position and why do you think you're best suited for the role? Uh, Val, we'll start with you. Thank you once again for this opportunity. You know, I am and I consider myself a true blue local kid born and raised in these islands. And I have really worked hard coming from a humble background to get an education, to get a trade. What I bring to the table is not just new energy, but a new type of, a new type of leadership, one who is willing to work across the aisle, across generations, and, and thinking forward as a single mom and a former special education teacher, and currently a member of the State House of Representatives, I feel that I bring a lot to the table with the ability to collaborate, to work hard, to learn and grow, make decisions as, as legislators, whether it's in the city or the state. My role is not to just create bills and have bills passed. My role is to be able to be a facilitator, to gather the knowledge that's out there and make the best decisions, to seek advice from those who have the experience and, and to make the best decisions. And I think being in office the last four years, especially during COVID has really helped me to be able to craft myself and just be rooted in who I am, but be able to offer the voters a new choice of leadership for the future. And Ron, we'll give you the last word. Yes. Yeah, so 
you know, there's several reasons why I'm running. Uh, you know, I was born and raised on the Big Island. And I, I was a member of a family. I'm a member of a family that's been very actively involved in public service throughout the years. My late father uh, was a former attorney and a member of the Hawaii State Supreme Court. Uh, and he and my mother were very actively involved in supporting civic causes and, and community organizations on the Big Island. So their involvement in the community really had a tremendous impact on me. They always em emphasized to me the importance of giving back to the community. So I view running for the city council as I have viewed running for other uh, public offices an extension as an extension of my family's tradition of public service. Moreover, as a husband and proud father of three sons who are trying to start their own careers, I understand, I know the struggles of Hawaii's families. You know, the high cost of living, living makes it difficult for those of us who live here to survive here. But with my ex years of experience in public service, I'm running for the city council, district eight, to help build more affordable housing, keep our neighborhoods safe and fight to give our kids a future here in Hawaii. I believe that the residents from Iea to Pearl City and Minilani deserve effective and experienced leadership. And so in that regard, I humbly ask for the support of the voters of the district of District 8 uh, in this upcoming election. All right, Val Okimoto and Ron Monor, thank you. Ron Monor, thank you so much for joining us here this morning and uh, sharing your views and participating in this conversation. Uh, we wish you both the best of luck and uh, continued success uh, beyond this. So thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you. Mahalo. Aloha. Mahalo. Well, good to hear from them. And Ryan, we heard kind of a departure from our earlier conversations. Uh, you know, we've given all of those candidates opportunities to ask questions of each other. Some really punted that opportunity. Others used it as an invitation to uh, perhaps, you know, collaborate post-election. But you really heard these two use that opportunity to try to highlight some differences. Um, you know, Val Okimoto has continuing continuously sort of projected herself and presented herself rather as an outsider, even though she has been a lawmaker uh, for some time now, but saying that, you know, she brings fresh perspective and new leadership and really, uh, you know, contrasting her relatively limited political experience with Ron Menor's decades of experience. He, of course, on the other hand, saying that he has, you know, vast leadership experience and can hit the ground running uh, and calling into question uh, a measure that she introduced when she was at the legislature regarding voting. Yeah, you know, I think it's also reflective of what what we saw in the primary with just how close this race was and how close many expect this to be with two prominent names entering into this district. And we weren't able to hit uh, all the topics that we wanted to discuss, but really seeing their stances uh, on this in number of issues from rail to affordable housing. We even briefly talked about Aloha Stadium and just overall leadership styles that each are trying to position themselves in a district that represents a number of different communities all with different personalities and different flavors. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens moving into the general election. Uh, we want to thank them as well as all the candidates running for city council for participating in this opportunity for uh, our viewers and those who tune into the Star Advertiser to get a glimpse uh, of these candidates beyond uh, of what uh, we just see on television and what we hear. Of course, ballots are dropping, I believe, next week already. And so uh, this is crunch time for the election and exciting to see how things pan out here as we move into the general election. Yeah, and all of those candidates in some way or another have referenced the issue of housing and homelessness. Uh, and so we're going to be lasering in on that on Monday. We'll be speaking to Scott Morishige, who of course is the governor's, uh, you know, the state person on homelessness and the state director rather uh, to address that issue. And IHS, Institute for Human Services, to talk about what's happening on the state level, what they're seeing, and also wanting to get their take on the impact of the city's core program and, and their take on basically what the state is doing because of of course, those two entities have to work uh, very well together. So interested to hear from our two guests on homelessness on Monday. We hope you have a great, safe weekend, and we'll see you right back here at 1030 on Monday. Aloha. We'll see you then. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.